My name's Andy Asarte. I manage the engineering department, and I'm joined today by Robin Dinosh, our manager of communications. Uh, Robin will be our moderator and receive your questions, so please feel free to send those through as I go through a presentation. Um, our engineering team with the town has a number of areas that we're responsible for, including transportation. Uh, we're responsible for uh, road construction as well. And I'm here today to provide a town hall style opportunity to share with you an overview of some of our recent work and for you to be able to ask questions. I'm going to share my screen here. In terms of format, I'm going to begin with an overview of the large capital project that's underway at Railway and Bull Valley Trail. I'm going to then take a bit of a step back and talk about transportation planning in general to provide some overall context. I'll then speak about some of the specific topical areas like the road changes in and around the town center and the design around Bull Valley Trail. Through my presentation, I'll provide information in response to a number of the questions that we're getting through social media in advance. And we'll leave a good amount of time at the end for, uh, for you to continue to, to write in your questions. The capital project work happening around the main intersection at, of Railway and Bow Valley Trail is actually a number of different capital projects that were approved in previous years being completed as one program. It includes a, a reconstruction of the main intersection, connection of new and upgraded water and sewer mains across the railway tracks and through the intersection, a new multi-use path, path on the west side of Bull Valley Trail, repaving and intersection crossing improvements on Benchlands Trail, and a multi-use path that connects in from the new intersection across the bridge, essentially a new pedestrian connection, uh, to the pathways that go up into Benchlands silver tip and to a new pathway that's constructed along Palliser Trail. Lastly, the project work consists of a new connection from the intersection into Spring Creek Mountain Village. The utility work itself is a new sewer main shown in purple and new water main. This is a life cycle replacement and upsizing and I'll speak about that in some more detail. In terms of project budget, the, the surface works budget for those five projects is 8.2 million and the budget for water and sewer the utilities is 5.2 million. The project is projected to be completed within budget and we did add some additional scope for, with the surface works. We came in a little under budget. We were able to add in pre-servicing for a future fire hall over by Palliser so we don't have to dig that road up in the future and we were able to add in some additional stormwater management infrastructure on Palliser Trail. Uh, there is a section of pipe outside of the project footprint. Within the project footprint, the pipe work was completed. There is a connection that'll need to be completed as part of a future project because of groundwater challenges and, and budget. We're asked about schedule, and yes, the project is behind schedule. We plan to complete utilities back in May and have the main intersection work completed at the start of October. Um, challenges with utility installation put us about six weeks back at the start of the project and our surface works contractor, a separate contractor from the one doing utilities, they've had issues with resources and performance and they haven't been able to make that time up and actually have fallen a little further behind. So we're seeing uh, more work push into the spring than we had anticipated. Um, we did have contingency in the spring, and so we are aiming to bring the overall project in uh, by June 30th with com full completion at that time. There have been a number of challenges that have contributed to those delays. I'd like to just go through a few of them. First of all, groundwater, it's an ever-present challenge that we have in the, the valley bottom. We have, uh, it's a river valley, we have granular materials, and, and so anytime you dig a hole, uh, you're going to need full-time pumping to keep that, that excavation dry. You can see in the photo here below the surface of the water is the, the sewer pipe that needs to be replaced. That water needs to be pumped into a settling pond to prevent impacts on the creeks. Our pond was constructed by the roundabout 
at uh, Spring Creek Gate. Groundwater was particularly challenging just with all the granular material in the intersection and it was a high groundwater year. And so some days by 2 p.m. this pit would be full. And so that slows uh, the progress of work. Towards the end, pumping wasn't even a, a practical solution anymore. Groundwater comes up and peaks in, in June and into July. And so for final tie-in, scuba divers were brought in to be able to make those connections underwater. And that, of course, is also very slow. The lines we're replacing are some of the deepest in town. The deeper you dig, the bigger your excavation, the more challenging it is to deal with traffic and groundwater. We were very close to, to buildings in the CPR tracks, and that meant we needed special shoring systems to prevent damage to the adjacent structure and, and settlement of the tracks. There are many existing utilities uh, throughout the entirety of the intersection. Uh, our pipes were constructed at the deepest point in the trench, again underwater is the sewer line being replaced, and that meant crossing gas, communication, electrical lines throughout the site. Traffic needed to be maintained at all times. There were uh, six separate road crossings and each time you cross a road, you need to stage traffic around it uh, multiple times. The longest uh, uh, crossing which of which was 150 meters, the big diagonal crossing of the sewer line. With the need to minimize excavations to limit the inflow of groundwater and, and to be able to manage traffic, you can only build short sections of pipe at a time. If you make longer trenches, there's more exposed gravel for water to infiltrate and you have no room to put the soil up on the surface or to detour traffic around it. So the many, many phases of work just to get the utilities in and then there's still some deep digging to do. Um, we have uh, that high groundwater issue in the valley bottom, so we don't have a typical uh, gravity storm water system where it goes into pipes. Instead, we build these large storage bins um, shown here those black bins store the groundwater and, and are later wrapped in filter fabric and that allows the water to infiltrate from uh, sewer storm sewer grates at the surface into this facility and then into back into the soil the traffic signal and street lighting systems are being upgraded to current standards and that means replacing all the wiring and ducts throughout the intersection and all of this work needs to be completed before paving. And so I hope it, it illustrates some of the challenge and staging and, and reason uh, why there was so much digging. If it seemed like it was slow and inefficient, it was because it, it, it is slow and inefficient work. It's tedious and time consuming. That said, uh, this was a very disruptive project uh, for everyone. And we uh, appreciate and are thankful for people's patience and understanding we understand that's certainly war and thin. Um, there are a number of areas where we need to do better and in particular, our, our second contractor needs to do better. Uh, traffic accommodation, especially for pedestrians, needed to improve better communication of traffic impacts, improved quality of the traffic setups. Um, we're quite disappointed with the way that they resourced this and that we didn't see more work completed this fall. And uh, we're using the tools within our contract to, to correct that. While typically we, like most municipalities, accept low bids for our projects, we do have mechanisms in place to exclude bidders from being able to bid on future work. And so this contractor really needs to step up and I think we'll see a much more productive spring as we move to, to completion. Um, the utility projects in this area uh, that have been completed over the past few years are some of the most challenging we have in our entire master plan and I, potentially because of where they're situated and how deep they are, uh, are some of the, the, are the most technically challenging. Uh, the new water and sewer mains are providing service capacity and firefighting flows needed to sustain a large part of our community over the coming generations. Uh, these are, are very important projects and we are happy to see them now nearing completion. The transportation changes too are some of our most challenging and equally important and I'll speak to that now. Transportation has been a priority of council and the community since I joined the town in, in 2011 and, and well before that. 
as a su successful uh, tourism-based community with a really strong local component. These challenges are, are not unique, they're very common. And over the past eight years, we've adopted updated our transportation planning and had adopted an integrated approach, one that's considering not just car travel, but also how we move people by foot, by bicycle, and by transit. Traditional transportation planning uh, consists of taking car volumes today and projecting an exponential growth, say something like a 3% annual increase. Uh, to avoid estimating traffic growth to infinity, they usually choose a study horizon of something like 20 years. And exponentially growing in infinite amounts of car traffic can take an infinite amount of space. And designers over the last 100 years have gotten remarkably skilled at designing these vehicle-centric roadways. That's generally come at the expense of other travel modes, which are not considered in, in design for the most part and until the end of a project if at all, and are an afterthought. There are many, many issues with this approach, the primary problem being that it doesn't work. Moving by people exclusively by car, if that's the only way we're trying to move people, it's incredibly efficient. And within a few years of completing a project like this, congestion returns to previous levels. The costs are enormous and studies show that with benefits vanishing rather quickly that the return on these investments are negative uh, within a decade. Perhaps uh, a blessing for us in Camor, we don't have infinite space. We're, we're highly, highly constrained. Land values are very, very high. Um, and so our planning historically has had this friction where we've recognized very early on we can't continue to grow our roads. Uh, to four, five, six lanes, we'll, we'll bottleneck the network all over. Um, and that we, we need to look at more efficient approaches. Here is a graph of the number of people that can be moved within each three meter space of our right of ways. And you can see that by private car, that number is the lowest. That number can be doubled if we run buses in those same roads. And the number of people you can move by foot and bicycle in the same space is higher yet. And this is core to our planning. And so we've changed the question we're asking. Instead of projecting a number of car trips, we're projecting the number of people trips. And we asked, if we keep traffic at today's level, or perhaps even reduce it, what does that mean for the ways in which people will have to travel? And the answer is that instead, of a future in which 84% of trips are taken by car in our peak summer season, we need to enable 40% of trips to be taken by foot, bicycle, and transit. The split between those modes isn't important, but having targets in our plan allows us to design infrastructure and uh, programs and services that will help us to reach those goals. Sorry, I just had a random slide in there. Um, and, and rather than forcing everyone to ride a bike all the time, it's only a small shift from where we're at today, where 80% of trips on a typical summer day are, are taken by car, to one in which 60% of trips are taken by a personal vehicle. This still means that one third of people drive 100% of the time in the summer or close to it by, by car. Another third of people are going to take the majority of their trips in the summer by car still. And our first major test of this approach was changes made to Spring Creek Drive. And on that corridor, what we've seen is that we've gone from 85% of trips taken along the corridor by car in 2016 to 54% taken today. And unlike road investment where that the benefits deteriorate over time. As we continue to build out the network, the, the investment we made here, the return on it continues to increase. And we expect that within the decade, 
we will see the majority of this tri the trips on this corridor taken by foot and by bicycle. People have asked about these types of designs and how adding sidewalks and paths require us to move, remove driving lanes. And uh, first I'd like to clarify that at the main intersection of the project, we are actually adding in lanes. There will be a new turn bay on Bull Valley Trail heading northbound and a new right turn bay heading eastbound on Railway Avenue. Coming down Benchlands where there used to be uh, shared through and right, it's now a dedicated right turn. And what those changes allow us to do is to operate the intersection in, in a variety of ways and in more flexible ways. For example, by completely splitting out the, the turn movements and giving them their own dedicated lanes, we can allow for through movements of uh, vehicles, cars, uh, sorry, vehicles, pedestrians, and cyclists to happen all at the same time without conflict, and then allow turn movements to happen at the same time without conflict. There are also added left turn bays at William Street to the north and Old Camor Road to the south. At Old Camor Road, we've been asked about uh, restrictions to left outs, and there will be those restrictions put in place to help uh, allow for flow of traffic and to prevent backups and prevent hazards. On several of our arterial routes, we do need to reduce lanes to, to make space, but that does not necessarily mean congestion. Since the 70s, cities have been converting two and four lane roadways to three lane roadways with turn bays, and this is what's happening at present and what's proposed at present on Benchlands and Palliser Trail. This has uh, some people concerned about capacity. However, what's been demonstrated in studies looking at dozens of these conversions is that the same number of cars can be accommodated. What happens is your, your outside lanes can now flow. The inside lanes where there was interruption from turn movements, that's, that's no longer interrupting the flow of, of the through traffic. And with that added space, we have the additional capacity to move people. Here we have a theoretical cross section uh, where we've taken four lanes and added better pedestrian cycle and transit facilities. By encouraging carpooling and transit use, a slight increase in the average number of people in a vehicle means many more people can be moved by auto. And with good capacity for walking and cycling, relatively modest volumes of people doing that results in a 66% increase in capacity to move people. We go from 30,000 person capacity to a 15,000 person capacity on that corridor, while still a full 72% of people are traveling by vehicle. There's now a large body of research and literature that concludes the safety of these roads improves significantly uh, while that traffic flow is maintained. And there are examples of this in cities throughout Canada and North America. This isn't to say that there won't be more delay for driving. We expect that the changes that we're making with signal timings will mean that it takes longer to drive through the Trans-Canada uh, interchange, for example, or to drive through the intersection at Railway and Bull Valley Trail. But that difference won't be a major one. And by creating safe and comfortable space for people to walk, cycle, and use transit, we have a chance of avoiding a future of extreme congestion that would otherwise come no matter how many lanes we could build. There have been uh, questions about some of the details like why red bicycle paths. Um, green is used on roads to signal, in North America, it's been used on roads to signal a conflict zone between people riding a bike and people driving. Uh, we tried that and it have moved away for a number of reasons. We found it was confusing you can't get green asphalt or concrete or paving stones. And so you end up using paint. That paint is very expensive and high maintenance and uh, generally doesn't look that great. Um, where we're using red is a little bit different. We're using it to indicate a separation uh, between cycling facilities, places for people to cycle and places for people to walk. And we create this separation where volumes of people are too high for it to be comfortably used as shared space. As we build out more and more of these facilities and connect them up, uh, add some more symbols on the ground, um, 
the system will become a bit more intuitive. You can get right in any, any material type and the color will last uh, for the full um, life of the infrastructure. So it was an easy choice for us to go this route. I'll talk a bit about the town center now. Uh, the town center is a unique challenge. It's uh, grown up from the days of a mining town. And a traditional approach where Main Street is the route where everybody drives, everybody does all their shopping, everybody um, uses the street for all the day-to-day -day function. However, it becomes a, a much bigger challenge for communities as you grow and, and, and get larger. And so without changing travel patterns or encouraging alternate transportation, traffic would grow from very high levels today to volumes that you would expect on a, a large collector roadway. Even today, it's not functioning well as that cross town connector. And we would just expect that it would continue to function worse and worse for that purpose, as well as um, that ad additional traffic means it's not a particularly welcoming place for people. To date, we've treated all our streets fairly similarly, and that means vehicle priority in terms of how space is allocated. Shown in yellow here, and you could really do this on any section of town, uh, the space for travel, storage uh, of cars, the parking of cars, for signs and traffic signals to regulate them consumes over 85% of all the open space in our town center. The integrated transportation plan envisions a, a, a change of, of the way those central blocks of Main Street work to be consistent with our long held desire for Main Street to be the heart of our community. This includes designation of those central blocks as an activity street, which simply means that it's a place for people with car access permitted, but primarily local traffic for accessing the businesses and no through traffic. That change in designation eventually comes with changes to the street design, which will make it feel more, much more pedestrian friendly and give far more space to pedestrian areas. There's that slide I was looking for earlier. Um, so if we can um, enable our peak summer traffic to be managed by encouraging alternative modes um, and um, shift the patterns of where some of that vehicular travel shift. So in this case, um, what we're showing here is that as we work towards the future, Green shows areas where we're looking to reduce traffic by either shifting mode or by uh, uh, having that traffic take alternative routes. So green is a decrease in traffic and blue is looking at places where uh, there is capacity where that traffic gets shifted to. And if we can accomplish our goal in shifting mode and shifting uh, travel patterns, then our streets can perform within their capacity well into the future. When the pandemic struck, there was a need to create space to social distance in the town center. And so we, we went back to those transportation plans and were able to accelerate some of the changes that were envisioned uh, based on those recommendations. That included creating a free flow condition at 8th and Main in order to and allow for and encourage the flow of traffic up to the, the collector road on 10th Street and the arterial road up to 17th. Uh, there was also a, a desire to improve the flow from 10th Street onto 8th Avenue and to allow 10th Street to become the bypass for Main Street. Uh, in a more formal way. And so that became a three-way stop. Uh, there was a, a desire to prioritize traffic flow on 10th Street rather than adjacent to the residential on 7th Street. And so some traffic calming was implemented with a new four-way stop. Throughout the entirety of the town center, um, where we have these very high volumes of, of people moving, as well as very high driver load. There's a lot of distractions, a lot of things to be paying attention to. 
having quick moving traffic in that environment is, is very dangerous and it makes it uncomfortable for people to use the street. And so we implemented um, a 30K speed limit across the town center. These changes help route traffic uh, around main, those blocks of Main Street onto um, those collector and arterial streets. And so we've, we've left most of those changes in place. They're consistent with the long range planning. It's the direction we want to move. And, and though there are still some bugs to work out there, it was demonstrated to, to be functional over the summer season. Uh, with the reopening of Main Street to traffic, we really didn't want to see a reestablishment of Main Street as the, the primary thoroughfare. And so we're encouraging through some signage uh, any traffic that does end up on Main Street to, to use 7th Street and encouraging people through communications and, and the traffic control to use 10. At the west end of Main Street, if you're a local, if you're shopping in the downtown and you're arriving for a local use, you're arriving from the east, um, you can make the right turn and, and return to your origin from 10th Street. Or if you're looking for parking and haven't found it from Main Street, that directs you into parking areas to the north. Um, if you're through traffic, obviously that's a, a big inconvenience. And again, the idea is that people use 10th primarily to, to make that crosstown movement. I know there are probably many questions that uh, I haven't answered yet uh, from those previously submitted and, and uh, that likely many more have come in. So I'll turn it now over to Robin. Thanks, Andy. Uh, we have had a few questions come in and while you've got your presentation up still, there was one question and maybe we can go back to this slide where um, it was the slide with the four images of the a and W intersection and the graphic with the yellow arrows, turning arrows and the other straight across arrows. Um, could we go back to that because we can't see uh, what the roads are beneath them. So I think it was um, one after that. It's, it's uh, a question, that one, back one more. Just passed it, that one there. Right. So perhaps you could just explain that one in a bit more detail. Sure. So this, um, it's oriented slightly differently, so I'm not surprised it's a bit confusing. This, um, this is the Eclipse Coffee, A&W, Shops of Camor, and uh, Blondies. Uh, so the, the main intersection, and, and really this is just a schematic showing how a signal phasing could work. So in the first phase, it would be all the three movements, pedestrian uh, in green, bicycle in blue, vehicle in yellow. Uh, the second phase has the switch in direction, and then the third and fourth phases clear all of the left and right turn days. Great. Thank you very much, Andy, for clarifying that. Uh, we've got uh, about seven questions that have come in live, and what I'm going to do is try and get through all of those. We also received a number of questions in advance of the meeting. Um, for those of you who haven't had a chance to submit a question yet, uh, you can just please type your question in the Q&A. If you click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen, we will be able to, uh, I'll read those questions aloud and um, Andy will try and answer as many of those questions as possible within the remainder of our session today. And while everyone has been incredibly respectful um, I, and I appreciate that. I just want to remind everyone that there are real humans on the other end of your screen and we absolutely welcome differences in opinion, but we all need to treat each other with respect. And uh, so I will get into some of the questions that have just come in live. So Andy, just some clarification about the Benchlands Trail coming from Cougar Creek to downtown. Will there be only one through lane? Uh, so coming down the hill from um, Benchlands, right now it's, it's a single lane. And uh, it opens up as you're approaching the, the lower intersection, it opens up into two lanes. The intent is to take the outside lane that opens up and delay adding that 
um, it'll be a dedicated right turn bay to go to Palliser. But if you're traveling down bench lands, you'll simply stay in the, the through lane, continue across the bridge. There will be a left turn bay to go to the highway. And as you um, finish crossing the bridge, it will then open up to three lanes, uh, a through lane, a right turn bay, and a left turn bay as you approach the main intersection. So it's just delaying the additional, the adding of that uh, lane until you're past the, the overpass. And that allows us to create space for that multi-use path on the north side of the bridge. Thank you. And there was a follow-up question from the same person. Has there been any thought to traffic backing up during peak hours by taking that second through lane away? Yeah. Uh, so in order to make these changes, that bridge is owned by Alberta Transportation and, and they actually need to see um, that 20 year projection of traffic volumes and performance. And so it was important for us and necessary for us to get permits to be able to demonstrate that it would function um, to an acceptable standard. For the most part, it will free flow, uh, but there will be times when there will be some additional delay moving through there. And, and that's the trade off I spoke about. We trade off some additional delay today to make a safe, inclusive network that people can travel in a variety of modes in order to prevent for much bigger delays in the future that would come if we left it as two lanes and did nothing to, to try to offset the, the growth in travel. That's a really good point, Andy. I'm just wondering if we can clarify that even more, uh, that you have often talked about that making all of these changes isn't going to make it better for people who need to drive their cars on a regular basis. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that and what will happen for people who need to be driving their cars? And just clarifying that we're not asking people to stop driving their vehicles. No, I mean, we need to be pragmatic and realistic and, and we all love to drive and need to drive between some of the time and all of the time. And we, we, we get that. Um, what, what we're saying is that um, if, if we uh, don't make any changes today, if we just continue down this path, then uh, we, will, we will certainly have greater delay in the future. And so this is the challenge with transportation projects. People want, they, they drive into a traffic jam and they want to be able to get through it. And so they say, Council, build us more traffic lanes. And council says to the engineers, we need more lanes, the cars are backing up. And those lanes get built, presto, more cars appear, and then you're back into traffic jam scenario. And we see that all the time. The challenge with the work that we're doing right now is that we're, we're actually going to make things slightly worse up front. That's a really incredibly hard thing to do, you know, because you're, you're bearing all the brunt of the negative impact up front. However, each year that goes on, you're going to see an increasing benefit. If you make these investments up front, what we project is that by 2030, instead of having uh, a three, four, five, 10 minute delay in congestion at the intersection, your delay will remain relatively constant. You might have an extra 30 seconds or an extra minute today, but we can maintain that delay well into the future without it increasing with that increased traffic. So it's a very challenging thing and it's, it, frankly, it's the reason that more of these types of projects don't get built because people don't like to see a negative impact up front. They wanna see a project go in and it make, a, make a difference right away. And in the long term, that just won't work. It, it will, will make things worse. So I uh, uh, hope that uh, answers that question. Thanks for diving into that a little bit better. And that segues nicely into a question that came in. And wondering about the eastbound light at Bank of Montreal is on a don't walk cadence of nine seconds, which makes it a three car light. I'm actually thinking that this person might mean the northbound when you are on um, Sixth Avenue. Um, oh, the, I, I'm, perhaps you know. Uh, and the 
person is wondering, is this on purpose because it's not effective to clear traffic? So maybe they are talking about eastbound on Main Street uh, at Bank of Montreal. They are, yes. Uh, and it's, it's 10 seconds uh, green time there. So originally it was 15 seconds. So at this intersection right now, we have a, a scramble crosswalk. Um, because there isn't room for turn bays and um, just the nature of the intersection, there's a lot of different phases. We've got a dedicated left turn bay or a de dedicated left turn phase. Then we've got a through phase. Then we've got uh, a through phase on six. Then we've got a pedestrian scramble phase. Each of those phases requires time. And so you get this really long um, cycle length. Uh, which makes it kind of bad for everybody, including pedestrians, which, which should be a priority in an intersection like that. So when we're looking at uh, trying to improve the way that that intersection is functioning, we have to, there's give and take, not every single movement can work really well. And in this case, what we've said is that if we, we want to discourage the through traffic on Main Street. We want to allow for locally accessing traffic on Main to be able to get out. And so we're in the process of adjusting those timings to get to the point where it's the right amount of time for locally accessing traffic while allowing the rest of those phases to, to move a bit more quickly. 10 seconds might not be the answer. We've gotten that feedback that only a few cars are getting through, so we're actively monitoring it. We try not to make changes on a daily basis. We try to make those changes and let them sit for three, four weeks. And I know it's painful, but it takes time for our traffic patterns to reestablish. And if we're, we're trying to chase things, we're, we may not get to the best outcome. Thank you. And while you've got that slide up, um, we've had a question about the corner of 8th Avenue and 7th Street by the Legion. And while turning left onto 8th Avenue, is it possible to put a no parking zone on 8th Avenue as there's a the concrete bumper in the in the middle of the road and with the car park there it reduces the turning radius onto 8th Avenue. Um, yes, uh, I mean we we, will, we can have a look at it. Um, so if I'm understanding that correct turning left off of 7th is challenging. I mean it's a challenging movement as is. Uh, made more challenging by needing to thread between parked cars and, and uh, the median. And if that's the question, then yes, we can take a look at that and, and restrict parking further if needed. Thank you. And we have a question about how we're making it more clear that the red pavement is a bike path. Um, someone just wanting you to reiterate whether um, you mentioned whether there'll be more cycling or, or signage or logos on the sidewalk. If you could just repeat that for them, please. Yes, uh, uh, we recognize that's a challenge, it's something new, and it, it's uh, also going to be confusing until there's a, a more general knowledge and, and um, a better, more connected network. So right now what we're doing is we're working on a standardized look and feel for symbols on the uh, pavement and some additional signage. We don't want to add too much because it should be, um, we just want to limit clutter. We're also looking at uh, an opportunity to use um, decals that go down on the ground for a season. And you may have seen these used elsewhere, but it would be um, an opportunity to do seasonal education campaigns. So ahead of the peak season, maybe put down some fun graphics that help explain it, but it wouldn't be permanent. You could pull it up afterwards. And so we're looking at that right now, especially around the new infrastructure around the uh, main intersection, having some fun and, and trying to use an education campaign on the ground. Okay, thank you. And speaking of the red sidewalks, uh, on Bow Valley Trail, how far down will the sidewalk or red bike lane extend on the north side of the road? Um, to William Street. Uh, at William Street, it transitions to a multi-use path on both sides of the road. We've left room in the road design to allow in the future as there's redevelopment to add a sidewalk and maintain the asphalt as a, a bike facility, either with uh, just adding some red symbols or at that time it might need a mill and overlay and you could put it down as red asphalt. So the plan is in the future, arterials will have separation of sidewalks and bike lanes wherever volumes warrant. In the short term, 
we've said that along the Valley Trail, it'll be multi-use. And as you approach the intersection, William Street from the north and Old Camel Road from the south, um, and then uh, around the intersection east and west as well, it'll split. And so as you go into the intersection, you'll have your own space to cycle and your own space to walk. Thank you. Uh, the next few questions are around visitors. And someone is asking if you've given any thought to a public bicycle service for visitors um, so that it encourages them to use the bicycles and parking their cars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's two, two pieces to that. One is how do we get visitors out of their cars? And then um, how do we connect them to, to the paths with a, with a bicycle? So there's been a couple ideas around that. We are, it's a priority of councils to look at intercept parking opportunities. And in our parking management plan, we, we suggest that if we can find good spots to park cars and then really nice walks into the downtown, that that would be um, one of a number of strategies that'll be needed to deal with uh, visitor traffic. The other one where we think that there's a lot of opportunity and we see it successful in Banff is we have literally thousands of parking spaces on Bow Valley Trail uh, ready-made for intercept and, and they're at the hotels. And so we have guests that come and spend a night and historically hoteliers and our, our, when we have consultants through, we ask them to check. They'll ask, how do I get downtown? And they'll say, go down, drive down here, turn left and, and head downtown. We really want to flip that um, and uh, have something like a hotel bike share like Caribou Properties is done in Banff where they have 150 bicycles that they maintain and operate for their guests. Have some sort of system where we can get bikes in the hands of the hoteliers and then have the hoteliers say, to get downtown, you take this, uh, leave your car here till four, you can check out at 11, but you can leave your car. Here's a map, walk down this nice new path on Bow Valley Trail, you connect through to the downtown. Here's a bike you can take if you want to go uh, visit some of our pathways. So we think we have a, a huge bank of intercept parking and it's, it, and it's been a, a discussion we've been having with the Hotel Association and the BIA uh, to move these initiatives along. But that's certainly uh, any opportunity we can get to get them to park their cars out there is going to be a benefit. Thank you. And uh, this question is related. Are there any plans to limit out of town private vehicle traffic in the downtown area. And then there's a sec, oh, I'll let you answer that. And then the, there's a second part to that question. Um, so if you're, if you're going to limit it, you need to give really good alternatives. Um, you can't just say, don't come, that's not going to work. And uh, you know, people have said, what about intercept parking in Palliser? You just have to put yourself in the position of a visitor. Are you going to drive into Camor, park in Palliser and wait 30 minutes for a bus or, or walk for half an hour. You're not, you're gonna to drive to as close to your destination as you can, unless you have something really enticing, like a nice walk that you heard about or whatever the case is. But um, when we think about the impact that visitation has, it, it's actually a little lower than uh, other impacts. So for example, visitors will come into the town center with twos, threes, fours, sixes, uh, in a vehicle. They'll park, they'll shop for a few hours, and then they'll move along. And so that's a really great use for parking, and that's a really great use for road capacity to bring in groups that are spending <clears throat> money and contributing to the, the economy. Um, so while we, we do envision giving options there, um, what we're really targeting is, can we give someone a, a bus fare to get downtown for work have them not bring their car in and have it sit for an eight hour, nine hour, 10 hour shift, taking up the, the uh, space uh, for a single person. That, that's a fraction of the benefit that a parking space can give otherwise. So how do we get single occupancy down in the town center, encourage turnover, you know, 30 minute use downtown, go get your coffee, grab the, the post. So 30 minutes free with paid parking, for example, having a charge for, for parking so that it encourages people to, to take the bus instead of parking their car all day. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then this is the second half of that question. So you mentioned pushing alternative modes of transportation. How are those modes going to be made accessible to those coming in by private car? Are there any plans to inhibit cars from entering any section of the downtown core? 
for example, having cars park a few blocks and then walk or cycle in. Yes, so that, that I think is speaking to the intercept parking concept. Mm -hmm. um, one of those ways that we can do that is have a, a charge in the downtown and then advertise free parking. And we, did, um, we didn't have a charge this year, but we did do uh, advertisement for parking at Elevation Place, for example. So right now we're looking at a potential agreement with the provincial building to expand parking in that area. And that could be a place where people park and then walk into the town center. You do need to create these incentive disincentive structures otherwise we're all human we bike right up to the door we drive right up to the door we check there first and if there's no parking then we circle around so by creating um, a, a, a paid parking structure it encourages people to look for alternatives and those alternatives could be intercept areas there's not a lot of room for them unfortunately uh, but there are areas outside the downtown that we expect could be used as parking Great. And while you've got the map up, um, another question, uh, questioner has observed that the yield signs at Spring Creek Drive and especially at Main Street and 8th Avenue are causing cars to roll into the crosswalk before stopping and are impacting pedestrians. Is that something that's been looked at as far as putting up stop signs instead? Um. So it's a question of design as well. There, there are a couple ways to address that. Stop signs um, are a, a very typical approach for sure. Um, the challenge with stop signs is, is it interrupts flow and it, it really will reduce capacity. And we're trying to balance those two things. At the same time, we want it to be safe for pedestrians. We want pedestrians to be able to move unimpeded. So uh, at this point, I mean, these are a couple of the first areas where we're doing this, and there's certainly areas that we monitor. Spring Creek, we bumped out the, the sidewalk and the, the bike path, and it works okay, but I think we bumped it out into a spot where it, where it does encourage cars to be parked over it. And there are two other approaches. One is to really bump it back, and then it allows for a full car to park there. We tried that out on, on bench lands, and, and uh, it didn't work very well. I don't think it's common enough here for people to understand how to use it. So more than likely what we're going to do is just bring that, those facilities closer to the road at the intersections uh, like we've done on, on Bull Valley Trail. We're, we're not going to be able to avoid it 100%. Um, either way, people are still going to roll onto the PED facilities. We can improve the markings and, and um, that could potentially help as well. For now, it's a, a thing that we're monitoring and and trying to balance all those, um, the flow versus um, inconvenience. Perhaps you could just take a couple seconds to talk about the flow and why yield signs, in your opinion, are better than stop signs at those intersections. Um, so stop signs just create a lot of, uh, lot of stop and go and that, that um, you know, it increases noise, it increases, um, uh, queuing um, and we, we have a, a lot of really great examples of places that primarily use yield signs to, to manage traffic flow and, and we've looked to those areas and so where we're at right now is monitor and see how things work um, from a, a function perspective other than the interruption of, of pedestrians on occasion on Spring Creek Drive that yield sign works like magic we took out to uh, left turn bay we took out a right turn bay, traffic volumes have increased, ped and cycle volumes have increased. Um, and there may be occasional backups there, but I haven't personally seen them in, in uh, hundreds of times being through that, including during busy times. So it, it, if you can get traffic slowed down to 30 kilometers an hour, what happens is, is people can then um, use uh, eye contact, use judgment. Pedestrians can enter into a crosswalk before a car comes to a complete stop that, without fear of being hit. The car can see that pedestrian take their foot off the gas, wait for them to cross and, and begin accelerating again without having to come to a full stop. And what you see is you can move a whole bunch of people through a, an intersection that otherwise would back up significantly. So we're trying to tighten these intersections up 
raise pedestrians and raise people on bikes um, up into a good spot where they have priority and they're in good view and keep slow and flow of traffic. And in that way, there may be some friction, there may be some inconvenience, but it's better than the stop and go and, um, and the traffic disruption that comes with that. Thank you. I've got a couple of questions about Elevation Place. So this um, speaks to parking. So in non-COVID times, the Elevation Place parking lot was often full. And what are regular residents going to do if we can't go to the library anymore, for example, because visitors are filling up the lots? Yeah, so, so I'm not suggesting that um, Elevation Place parking lot would be used for visitor parking. Um, we, we acknowledge that that parking is well used and uh, will need to continue to be well used. What we do see is some time of day, time of week shifts where downtown is generally busier when elevation place may not be. And so there could be some synergy there between the two. And there would have to be some, some strategy to manage uh, spillover into EP parking. Um, the flip side is if we can expand that and have it as a shared parking facility with some intercept parking function is that if there's a big event at EP, it can actually spill over into that area as well. So certainly the priority for the parking will be for EP use and, and not for intercept parking use. Thank you for clarifying that. And the other question about Elevation Place is why was a roundabout, a roundabout not integrated by Elevation Place? Yeah, it's a, a good question and, and potentially would have been a good, good solution there. I know as we worked through different concepts for Railway Avenue, we considered and I believe the current design has some kind of, maybe not quite a full roundabout, but it's a mini one uh, for that intersection. Um, I think, you know, when EP was designed, we weren't really thinking in terms of progressive designs at the time. And roundabouts, the historic approach has been is if you have three or four balanced legs. So really high traffic on each of the legs, you use a roundabout. But if you have two very high volume legs and one that's not, the through movements end up blocking that anyway. So I don't think when they were thinking about that intersection, it would have been a candidate for a roundabout. But now as we're looking at some, maybe a bit more progressive designs, I, I think slow the speeds, tighten up the road. Um, it, it's uh, like a kidney bean shape, but a uh, Kind of an oblong roundabout could be a potential solution there something we'll look okay. at in, in future years and we have time for a few more questions uh, moving back over towards benchlands trail what is the plan for widening the pedestrian crossing across the west side of the benchlands highway one overpass um, west side of the benchlands highway one overpass um, can you read that one more time, please? Most what is the plan for widening the pedestrian crossing across the west side of the Benchlands Highway 1 overpass? Don't think there's a, there isn't a pedestrian crossing on the west side of the overpass. There's one at the main intersection, and then there's one at the east side of the overpass on the Cougar Creek side. Mm -hmm. um, the plan is to just bring it up to standard. Both of those crossings will be brought up to standard, which is to say the crossings are widened and they're brought through a central median. Okay. So, so we're safe haven in the middle. That's right. Wherever we're crossing pedestrians across multiple lanes of traffic on our arterial streets, our engineering guidelines require that be done through the middle of a, a refuge island. Now, Refuge Island does a couple things. It slows speed, but it also cuts the crossing distance from, in that case, it would be something like 30 meters or 20, 20 meters to um, either three and a half meters for one lane or six meters, six and a half meters for two lanes. So um, with all of our crossings that you'll see in and around Benchlands and Bow Valley Trail, they'll be widened out to accommodate um, pet and bicycle and be given tactile strips for visual impairment um, mm -hmm. and um, that median refuge. Okay, and then this is also related. How are we going to encourage bicycles to use the paved pathway, uh, say along the north side of Benchlands Trail, instead of using the driving lanes? Cyclists often use the road and on a restricted road width like that, it 
seems unsafe when there's a nice mm -hmm. trail that cyclists can use. Yeah, it's a really interesting challenge. Um, you know, people historically have, have cycled on the street because there isn't an alternative. And the people who have cycled in society, North American cities, have been people who are very strong and fearless. And so when you start to make infrastructure that is intended to accommodate people of all ages and abilities, some uh, you'll see people from that strong and fearless group speaking out against it. And the reason is, is because they want to go fast and they want to go direct and they're used to being in traffic and now they're being asked to go in these other facilities, which usually are pretty substandard. So what we're trying to do as much as possible is make the facilities that we're constructing attractive enough, first of all, that the majority of people are going to choose to use them and uh, wide enough and uh, to, a, to a standard that would allow a mix of both faster moving and slower moving uh, traffic in them, cyclists and, and pedestrians in it without creating uh, excessive conflict. Are we gonna get everybody into those paths? No, they're still gonna be, be um, looking at you, RMCC, uh, people who wanna go fast, don't wanna be held up and uh, will be on the road. But in terms of providing a safe alternative to, for the people who aren't strong and fearless, um, that's really our goal. Great, thanks. I'm gonna answer two more questions uh, because I know we're getting close to our time limit. Uh, why wasn't the entire top lift of asphalt repaved throughout the project area? There's potholes in the old asphalt that remains near the old Canmore Road intersection, for example, and now there's a number of joints that will give opportunities mm -hmm. for future failure of the asphalt. Yeah, it is a, a bit of a patchwork uh, quilt there, and um, I think when the designers were looking at that, they were trying to preserve as much of the good quality asphalt as possible. And, and perhaps we should have gone a, a bit further with that because I agree there's some, some transitions and, and you know, this goes to the performance of the contractor as well. If those are done right. It's not a big deal. And, you know, by next summer, you're going to, it's all going to look the same though. It'll be harder to tell, but there are a lot of joints out there. Some of them weren't done well. So, you know, um, maybe that was uh, something that should have been been uh, just mill it all and get it done. And, and uh, in retrospect, we probably would have done that. But you're saying that it will be better in the spring? Well, I mean, just with time right now, everything's either black or gray, but everything will be gray. Those joints will be less noticeable. Um, mm -hmm. You're going to have joints regardless, and, and they're a maintenance challenge. But uh, we probably could have done a bigger footprint. And, and so we'll patch up anything that's a pothole. Obviously, we'll get uh, redone and, and done right. And that'll be something uh, we can plan over the winter time for next spring. Okay. And then uh, the, there's a question about once the new fire hall is functional, and that, that's the new fire hall that'll be on Palliser Trail, how will emergency vehicles navigate, especially when it's congested, as they cross Bow Valley Trail into downtown on Railway Avenue? Um, especially if it's a single lane, vehicles will no, have nowhere to move out of the way. Um, though it's a, a single lane on the bridge, it's still uh, four lanes wide. So there, the central median's coming out, it's, it's just being replaced by paint. And so at no point along their journey will they be pinched uh, into a single lane coming from the fire hall into the downtown and there'll be room for, for cars to move to the side. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we didn't get to everyone's questions today, but uh, please be assured that we will take your questions and we will absolutely email you back with an answer. And um, uh, I just want to thank everyone. I think we had a total of 38 people join the virtual town hall today. And we will be posting a recording of this event on our website and on Facebook. So if you didn't get your question answered, you can still email it to ask us at camor.ca and we'll do our best to answer it. And we'll post this for anyone who didn't uh, get to join us today. So thank you so much, Andy, for taking the time to answer everyone's questions. No problem. Thank you for everyone attending. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>